branding and why you need it. In this video, I get to interview Max Kerwick, who is actually a branding consultant and an expert. He's been doing it for a few years. He used to do it in the tech industry, and then he moved over to physical products, and he's gonna be talking about things that a lot of people are doing right and a lot of people are doing wrong and how to really understand your customer and who's gonna be purchasing your product on Amazon, right? So whether you're trying to get into Amazon private label and you're on a smaller budget and really, you know, you can't afford twenty, thirty thousand dollars to hire a consultant like, you know, Max, there's still other things that you could be doing to really understand who your customer is and how you could help serve them, right? Not sell them, but serve them. So this is gonna be an interview with Max. I mean, super smart guy. He's been doing it for quite a bit. Um, Tom actually hired him for one of his brands and he did a phenomenal job of trying to find who the target customer is and whatnot. So it's a really cool interview. I highly recommend, especially if you're trying to, you know, brand yourself, create a brand name, trademarks, packaging, you know, positioning and everything on Amazon. I mean, this video is for you. So hopefully you guys enjoy it. Hello, Max. How are you, man? I'm good, David. It's good to talk to you again. Yeah, it's good to see you. So I first heard of you when I was uh, back in Austin. I think it was back in August at the Brand Builder Summit at Ryan yep. Daniel Moran. So that's the first time I saw you speak. And that was an amazing presentation that you you gave. And essentially, I figured I'd bring you on the podcast because a lot of our listeners, people that are you know listening right now are kind of in the stages of creating brands or maybe they're already selling on Amazon and they have a brand name, they have a trademark, they kind of have a niche and a, a direction they want to go with, but they don't really understand understand who their customer is. So I figured I'd bring you on. So how's it going? How's uh, you're in Puerto Rico, by the way, man, that's crazy. Yes, I am. I'm in Puerto Rico and I'm in like the weirdest space, physical space right now. Like I'm, I'm at the hotel. We just met with a bunch of wedding vendors. And if you're just listening to this, you won't be able to see, but I'm going to show everyone that's watching on video. I'm in the middle of this like very weird banquet space and then I can like see the beach in front of me. But. <laughs> that's the, so that's anyways, the yeah. laptop lifestyle right there. Yeah, that's right. Working from anywhere, working from everywhere. Yeah, so so all, that's awesome, man. Work from anywhere and I love that. But can you tell us a little bit about like yourself, your background and how you got to where you are? Because I mean, you're at the point where you're speaking not only at the Brand Builder Summit, but you were in Vancouver. You had a whole presentation where you talked to our audience about branding and positioning in the physical product space. So can you tell us a little bit like how'd you get there like how'd you even end up where you are today yeah absolutely and just for people who don't know me i like to say that i transform businesses into brands um, i have a, a company called brand builder strategy and at this point i work probably like 95 percent with e-commerce businesses but i started out kind of early in my career working in tech and working in media that's where all the money was that's where all the venture money was that's where if you were going to sell a business and make a lot of money on it, you were going to do that with the tech company. And I started out working in branding. I had a research background and a journalism degree, and I didn't want to be a researcher or a journalist. So I was looking for something that I could kind of leverage both of those skill sets. And I just kind of lucked into this position where I would go do research with customers, go out and talk to them and figure out, okay, who are they? What do they want? What do they like? Why do they... Um, you know, what's the story that they're trying to tell about their life and all that kind of stuff. And then take the information that I got there and create marketing messages out of it. Right. And so then I get to put some of that journalistic writing skills to use. And so it just happened to be kind of a perfect combination. And like I said, I was working almost all with like venture funded tech companies and was really cool, was really exciting for a while. But uh, my, my experience with tech entrepreneurs is that they think they're kind of God's gift to the world. I and mean, a lot of things that they would raise $10 million of somebody else's money and just blow it all. And the company would never turn into anything. And so I got kind of tired of that. And around the same time that I was getting tired of that, I had built a team up. I was working for in another business and kind of running all of the strategy work there and was tired of working for someone else, was tired of working in tech. And around the same time, I met Ryan Moran uh, just kind of socially. And I had no idea that this Amazon world even existed at the time. This is probably two and a half, three years ago now. And I was just fascinated, just absolutely fascinated because here are these businesses that are able to scale very quickly, right? To go from nothing to selling hundreds of thousands of dollars in a month. And they're doing it with either very little branding or actively shitty branding, like really, really bad stuff. And so I was just kind of blown away by what people were able to do with, with a limited brand. And then the more I thought about it, the more I realized kind of how Jeff Bezos, Amazon, Evil Empire kind of thing were just really, really, really using these brands to build their own brand, right? Amazon 
is building its own brand on the back of all of these people who are selling on its platform, right? And as I got kind of more and more involved and more and more interested, started taking on clients of my own in the space, I saw how there was kind of a big difference between people who were thinking about it strategically, right? And Amazon, using Amazon as a sales channel to build a real business, right? That they could sell on their website, they could sell into retail, using that success, selling their business at a high multiple, multiples that I used to only see in tech. And as the space heat up and got more competitive and stuff like that, I just saw more people needing kind of the brand strategy work that I offer. And you know, I've been working in it full time for a couple of years now. And yeah, I, my sweet spot is kind of with brands that have gotten into the low mid seven figures on Amazon and are looking to scale up other other sales channels. So through their website, sell into retail, things like that. And you, the things that you need to do that successfully are very different than the things that you need to sell on Amazon successfully. So that's kind of my sweet spot. And that's kind of how I got to where I am today. That was a, a little bit of a rambling story. But no, no, that's awesome. Question. So so are you doing any consulting for tech companies right now? Or are you kind of, is that? Yeah. Okay. No, I still do that. I just not as much. I kind of pick and choose the ones that are interesting to me. The, the biggest problem with tech companies and being a service provider to tech companies is that they literally don't make money. Like they're not profitable. They're never supposed to be profitable. The whole idea is to build up a business, running it at a huge loss until it gets to a point where someone else thinks they could make money off of it. So basically, okay, let's say they raise a hundred or like a one and a half million dollars, right, from venture capital. And they set aside $200,000 of that for marketing, right? anything that I do for them has to come out of that pot of money. There's no extra money going into that because they're not making any money, right? Versus working with a cash flowing, profitable e-commerce business, right? All of a sudden, there's so much more you can do because you're constantly reinvesting in the business, it's constantly scaling and growing. And just from a marketing and branding perspective, it's a lot, lot, lot more interesting. I still like tech. Tech is interesting. It's just a, like, you know, honestly, m people are mostly assholes and it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's you're a little dealing, different from it's a financial a, It's a different, different type of a customer, right, for you. So what would you say is like, how's branding and tech a little bit different than, than physical products? Because with physical products, I mean, there's so much that goes into it with like packaging, design. And I mean, I would assume like tech's really similar, but just like what type of branding would you do on tech? In, in tech or is it essentially more of customer research to see who's going to be using that product? Yeah. I mean, in some ways it's no different at all, right? Like great branding kind of a, like the principles apply regardless of what type of business it is, right? Great brands start with their, their best customers in mind. Great brands are designed to elevate that customer and kind of make them the hero in their own story. Great brands deliver a consistent experience regardless of, you know, whether you're buying a product or seeing an ad or engaging with customer service or whatever. So those things are the same. The biggest difference is, and I go back and forth on this and, and it kind of is like when I was working only in tech, I thought products were way more interesting when I'm working only in products. So sometimes I think tech is more interesting, but the biggest difference is tech like software, let's say, the problem that it solves is usually like very specific and the way that it solves them is it's just different, right? Like when you're selling a physical product, it's something that people just get, right? They, they see a supplement and they understand like, okay, that's something that I'm going to hold in my hand. It's going to do this thing that it says or whatever versus software or something like that. That's a little bit more kind of ephemeral. You have to really kind of sell the experience of using that software and what it's going to do for your life versus something that people kind of intuitively get. So in some ways that's harder, but in some ways it's also easier because like if you don't do a good job with brand and you don't do a good job with like, here's why this product is gonna change your life, then it's just a product, right? It's very easy for a product to become a commodity. It's a little bit harder for software to become a commodity that makes sense. No, that makes perfect sense. And I, I totally understand. Whereas like in software, essentially a lot of people use tools that they don't really even know that they're subscribed to or using and they almost like forget about it. Whereas like a physical product, if you take that supplement every single day, like you're reminded it, you know, you have to like pick it up, you have to touch it. It's tangible. Whereas like software and SaaS, I mean, it's all super intangible and it's easier to forget because there's so much of it. Yeah, it's easier to forget. But then on the plus side, it's, it's almost easier to sell, like from a marketing standpoint, it's almost easier to sell kind of like the razzle dazzle magic of like, oh my God, the software is gonna change your business, right? Like, especially on like B2B sales, right? Like you can, 
you can sell like, okay, here's how, you know, this is going to increase your business by a million dollars or whatever. Like that type of sale in some ways is easier than like buy this product. Here's why ours is better than all of the other products like this. This pill is going to make you lose a hundred pounds tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that type of marketing, like people are pretty skeptical of, right? And understandably, right? And they should be. But if I'm selling something that kind of is a commodity, right? If I'm selling pet supplies, like leashes and things like that, like it's pretty hard to convince someone that I've done something interesting with a leash versus with software, you can kind of say like, oh, okay, we added these features and we specifically built them for this person in this use case. And it's a little bit easier to, mm -hmm. to sell that differentiation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so on the physical product side of things, right? Cause most people listening like myself, I mean, everyone's selling physical products. I would assume listening to this podcast, right? What would you say is like a starting point in, in your job and what you do day to day in, in, in branding and positioning when it comes to physical products? Like where do you start if someone approaches you, a client or someone comes to you and they're like, hey, I, I wanna start a brand or I, yeah, someone that wants to get started with the brand, not that they already have one, but they just wanna start a brand in the physical product space. Like what is like step one for you and step one for them as well? So step one, and th again, this is, this is definitely true for physical product, but this is true across the board for anyone who's starting a business, right? is understanding the person that you are trying to serve, right? Not the person that you're trying to sell to, the person that you're trying to serve. Because at the end of the day, great businesses and great brands are built around a specific customer. They know exactly who that person is. And it's not like, you know, you heard, you've heard me speak twice now, right? And I'm kind of on this crusade against what I call like, you know, the scourge of busy moms. I talk to a lot of guys, you know, yours at your age, Tom's age, my age, whatever, that like have never really interacted with a mom before, right? Other than their own mother, right? That, but, but not as an adult, not as someone. And when I ask them, okay, who is your company built around? Who, is, who are you selling to? You know, who are you serving? All that kind of stuff. They're like, oh, you know, I, I have this busy mom, right? This, this mom that's 35 to 55 that's got a couple kids or whatever, but they don't really understand like what makes that woman tick, right? And what, what she's really trying to achieve with her life and kind of what the emo like what her day even looks like and kind of the role that this product or this category can play in that day. And I just think that's a huge miss, right? That's the way that people get into, they think, okay, I'm gonna start a physical product company. So what products am I gonna sell? And so they start out and they just pick a couple products and then they copy the marketing of the most successful people in their category. And at the end of the day, that's just, there's no reason for that company to exist, right? You might be able to successfully carve off some money for a short period of time, but someone's gonna come along that does understand that customer, right? And does really get what they need and understands what they need to hear in order to buy right? And they're just going to eat your lunch. And then the only lever that you're going to have to compete against them is price, right? And you're going to just reduce price and then your margins are going to crash. And you're all of a sudden you're going to be in this business and you're going to be losing money hand over fist and you're not going to understand why. So you can avoid all of that very easily by being very intentional about, okay, I need to go out and understand the person that the, the person that, I, that you're I'm trying to serve essentially, right? And you exactly. know, in, in the physical product space, or at least people that are starting off, and most people are starting off on a smaller budget, right? Maybe they don't have $200,000 in marketing, you know, capital to invest, and they have, you know, five, ten thousand $10,000, and this is something that they would want to do on them by themselves, right? And in the Amazon space, a lot of people use these tools, right? Like Viralange, Jungle Scout, to find a product, yep. and they find a cool market to get into that has pretty high demand, doesn't have a lot of competition, low reviews, and they want to go in there, and they know they're supposed to build a long-term brand like they understand this is a long-term play uh, but obviously they just don't have crazy amount of capital for branding and positioning and all that but they do have a lot of time maybe so what would you recommend for someone getting started that doesn't have a crazy budget but they do want to create a brand and obviously improve the product and serve a customer and understand them a lot better than the current competition because their goal isn't really to create a me too product their goal is to really build a long-term brand but they are on a budget yeah so that's a great question and something that i run into a lot like especially when I'm speaking at events and stuff, obviously, if you're just starting out, you shouldn't be spending the twenty or thirty thousand dollars that it costs to work with me to to build a brand, right? You should be doing it, kind of bootstrapping it, and kind of branding along the way, which I think is the right way to do it. But so there's a couple things. One, find people in your life around you that you think might be the, like the ideal customer, right? If you're selling baby gear, right, you should go find new mothers, right, and you should go talk to them. You should go talk to your friends who are pregnant or, or whatever, your cousin or, or someone like that, just to get the perspective of someone who's living that life right now. And just having a conversation with them and not, 
again, this is not a demographic conversation. This is not how old are you? How many kids do you have? What does your household income look like or whatever? That's, that's useful. But really just trying to understand like, what does your day look like? Like, what is the worst part of your day every day? What is the best part, right? What is the role that, you know, if you're selling a baby bag or whatever, like what is like when you go out and you have everything perfectly packed and you have all the stuff that you need and it's just a really seamless experience. As soon as your you know, child starts crying, you have the bottle, you know exactly where it is. You're able to, you know, kind of get them happy again, make that outing. Like, what does that feel like versus the time when you have a bag and it's just full of crap and you don't know, you know, try to understand like the experience of that person's life and the role that you can play in it. Right. So that that's the first thing. Right. And you can usually. That's the, the great thing about selling consumer products versus software, right? If I'm selling software, I might not be able to find the CMO of a Fortune 500 company that I can just go out and talk to and see what he needs for his business, right? That's going to be really difficult to do without funding. With a consumer product, it's pretty easy to find someone who might be using that product, right, and have those conversations. So that's the first part. The second part is social listening. And uh, actually, Stephen Black, who also st spoke at um, your conference in, in Vancouver, he talks about this a lot, but there is so much information available online, right? Reviews of your competitors, seeing kind of what people talk about when they talk about the product, finding groups online, right? Facebook groups are great for this, where you can find these kind of niche communities where people are really dedicated to, you know, whatever it is. And I'll just continue to use this, this new mom example, right? There are so many communities for new moms, right? There are so many places where you can go. And Obviously, if you're a 28 year old dude, it's a little bit hard to join those groups without looking a little, little creepy. But if you can kind of come, come in there and, and, and be honest with your intentions and everything, just try to understand or whatever, and just kind of sit in there and observe, you'd be stunned at how much more you can understand the person that you're selling to, right? So those are probably the first two places that I'd start on a budget. And then from there, it's, it's just about testing things, right? A lot of people can kind of get in that analysis paralysis where like, okay, they go out, have a couple conversations, they go out, do a bunch of social listening, and then they go out and have more conversations and they do more social listening. Then they check the stats again on viral launch and then, you know, and they get caught in this cycle. The main thing is like, have those conversations, listen, and then put stuff out in the world and see what people respond to, right? Like you can form a hypothesis based on the information that you get from conversations and social listening, but then it's like put it out in the world and see what people actually respond to and iterate from there. And then once you have your own customers, you should be like, this is the difficult part about Amazon, right? Because they don't give you access to the customers. But if you can put an insert in your product and drive them to a, a landing page or something, collect their email, if you can, whatever it is, right? You need to, to be on the lookout for what makes my customers unique, right? What, what is the common thread that binds all my customers together? And as that customer base grows, if you start from the beginning talking to them and having those conversations, then by the time you get to 1,000 customers or 10,000 customers, you're going to understand them in depth. You're going to know exactly what they need, who they are, all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of an iterative process. Right, right. So so can you tell us a little bit more about that? So let's just say, yeah, I mean, obviously you kind of said branding as you go and positioning as you're kind of moving forward with your brand here on Amazon. Uh, so if you're selling on Amazon and you put these inserts in, people opt into like a money chat or whatever, what do you usually do? Would you recommend following up with like the first person? And if so, like what... Like how, do, how exactly would you follow up? Do you hop on the phone? Do you email them a survey? Like what exactly yeah. do you do in order to so get this info? All of the above, when you're first starting out, you should be trying to have like quality conversations, right? So you should, for your first customer, first 10 customers, first 100 customers, whatever, the first ones that sign up, right? Trying to get those people on the phone, even if it's just for a 10 minute conversation, maybe you include as part of the sign up getting their phone number, right? And you just set aside some time every week to just do some, some calls. And you know, maybe like one in every 10 people is going to pick up, right? But having that, A, it's a great touch point with the customer, right? That's a, you know, the founder of the business is calling and you can start off like, oh my God, thank you so much for buying the product. You know, just want to check in on you, see how you're doing, all that kind of stuff. Like how often has that happened to you? Never. No, like that is a level of service that literally never exists in most businesses. So A, you're making this huge leap forward and establishing a relationship with this person where they're like, wow, the CEO actually called me. That's amazing. But then also you can then go into that conversation of like, hey, you know, I just want to, we're early stage company. I just want to get a better handle on my customers. Make sure that, you know, the products that we're making for you are, are what you need and are designed for your lifestyle and all that kind of stuff. And you don't have to have a, an hour long conversation with them, but just 10 minutes of like, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. What do you care about? Where, like, where are you trying to get? Like, what do you care about as it relates to these products? Even if you just ask like three to five questions and you do that on a regular basis, 
you're going to have such a better idea of who the people are that are buying your product. Right. That, uh, that makes that, perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes it so much easier to write copy, to create ads. Like you're going to get used to the language that they use when they talk. And that makes copywriting so much easier. You're going to get used to like the areas that they live. Like I love to ask people what other brands they like right now. And if they love outdoor voices in Lululemon or whatever, that gives you ideas for like, okay, that's the type of marketing that this person responds to. And I can look at what those businesses are doing that's making them so successful and, you know, try to bring over those same principles in my business, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. And something that we did, so obviously what, what we did, we actually didn't have like, before doing this brand, we didn't have like a list of customers just because really in order to have like your true customers, these are people that have to buy from you, like literally take out their wallet or whatever, do a full yeah. price buy, not some like, you know, give away 80% off, 90% off. Cause that's yeah, not those, a real customer. Those people are not good. <laughs> not good. You don't want to build your business around people who only buy from you when you're it marked down to 20%. Right, right. You don't want to, you don't want to have like a discount brand essentially. But something we did, we were able to build a many chat list at, on a product testers page up to like 10,000 people, close to 10,000 people for like 25, 35 cents a lead. And it was a huge That's list. Awesome. And then we created like a long survey. It was probably like 15, 20 questions. And we asked Perfect. a lot of those questions that you just mentioned, right? Like kind of the whys, not like asking like, oh, how old are you? What's your income? Blah, blah, blah. Like, that's great. Yeah. Like those are good to kind of trickle in there. But if you really ask the whys, of the whys, you really start getting a lot of info. And we noticed that out of the 10,000 people we almost surveyed, like you, you start to get a really good idea what these people look for and what they check and what really matters to them. And it was it was surprising because we were going to move forward with some of the things on our, on our packaging or some things that we were going to do with the product. And I'm glad we didn't because if we did, like it's our customer essentially wouldn't like that. And at the end of the day, this isn't our true customer because this is it was a product testers page that we just built to survey people that we would think buy our product, which is still pretty close and it did exactly. a solid job. Yep. Yeah, and, and so that's that's a perfect kind of segue into the next thing. So when you have a very small base, right, phone calls are great. Obviously, as you get bigger, you can't like, you can't scale that. Um, so when you get to the point where you have 1,000, 10,000 or whatever, having like regular survey that you send out, right? And as like when you get new customers in the door, having them take the survey just to understand you know, who they are and, and offering some sort of, you know, they can be entered into a monthly drawing or whatever if they do it. But yeah, the, like people really, really gravitate towards like demographics and age, income, ethnicity, education level, all that kind of stuff. Those are descriptive, which is great, right? It describes your audience, but it doesn't really help you understand them, right? So I'm really looking for those whys and those how questions which really helps me understand the people and then I can market to them more effectively. And sure, I'll get the descriptive stuff later and that helps, right? But like if you look at Facebook ads, right? They want you to target off interests because they know that's more effective than targeting based on age or income or ethnicity or something like that. Right, right, it makes perfect sense. So when it comes to to branding on Amazon and e-commerce, right? When you someone's essentially, they found their product and stuff, how important would you say like the actual brand name is? Like the trademark portion, something that you're gonna run with, right? Like Nike, Adidas, like would, I mean, a lot of people I feel like struggle with this. They just spend, <laughs> I mean, I remember when I was starting off my first brand, I mean, I probably spent over like two weeks trying to like draft something up and make sure that it's like perfect, get the perfect exactly. logo. Like I know I know this is kind of like, cause it's like your baby, right? Like you want to make sure it has a cool name, cool exactly, logo. Exactly. Yep. So do you have any tips or recommendations for this? Yeah. There's two questions in, in what you just said, right? You asked is how important is the name and do I have any tips and tricks? Right? So I kind of think of names as the same way or in the same way that I think about tattoos, right? Where like when you're 18 and you're like, okay, I can get a tattoo for the first time. Like you can think like, oh my God, this has to be so meaningful. Right. And I have to go like find something that is like, you know, insanely personal and meaningful so that I have the story of people ask about it or whatever. And then like by the time you're like 25, 26 and you've known a bunch of people that have tattoos and you've gotten tattoos yourself, you realize like, OK, the most important thing is that the tattoo just like resonates with me. Right. That it looks that I like the way the art looks, that maybe it's meaningful, maybe it's not, whatever. But it's just like I need to enjoy it. Right. My biggest thing on names is like people treat like, especially on your first business, people are like, Oh my God, it needs to be this like super meaningful thing that has this amazing story behind it or whatever. And the truth is it really just needs to be something that's going to resonate with your audience, right? Like at the end of the day, that that's really what's important. And again, you can get an idea from that of that by like talking to people and understanding like what they do care about and kind of using that as a starting point for names. 
But the most important thing is to just have a name that you can trademark and that your audience doesn't actively dislike. Like those are the two criteria. And if you spend like, yeah, sure, having a great name can be a huge benefit, but that's a really hard needle to thread, especially when you don't have a lot of money to go buy a, an amazing URL and, and do all that kind of stuff. So I think names are a little bit, like as long as it's not like an as actively detracting from what you do, and it resonates with your business, then I think you're good. And, and the key is to just not overthink it, right? Have something simple, have something evocative, right? That kind of talks about the benefit or, you know, something like that, like that, that's kind of my general thing, but it doesn't need to be like, uh, oh, the Greek God of whatever, because that's so meaningful. And then you like create some story out of this, you know, I see a lot of people try to do that and it's just like, no one really cares. Right, it makes sense. I like that analogy of a tattoo. And I mean, it makes sense why people kind of struggle with this at first, but I feel like once you kind of build momentum and you get to the point where it's like, you're doing millions of dollars in sales, like you said, it doesn't really matter what the name is. People are still going to like your product. And at that point, when you're starting off, the name might sound really stupid, but then it just like, once you get to the point where like people are buying it, like it's going to sound super cool. It's kind of like saying your own name, right? Like, oh, David Zaleski. I mean, it kind of sounds kind of boring, right? But if all of a sudden yeah. I blew up and I was some like hip hop rapper or whatever, everyone would be like, oh, that's such a sick name. Like, you know, and it would just like exactly. click with people. If you're doing cool shit, people will think your name is cool. Yeah. If you're doing really lame shit, then people are gonna think your name is lame. Like right. that's that's just kind of how it works. Like, like if, yeah, if your sure, name's Riff Raff, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I, I think the same thing with logo, right? Like, yeah, have a like having a badass logo is awesome, but what makes a logo like again, a pretty normal logo can become badass if it's attached to a badass company. Like how often do you see a logo out of context of the company and be like, oh my God, that's amazing, right? It happens sometimes, but 5% of the time, like it's pretty, pretty uncommon. So again, it's both of those areas for me are more like disaster testing, like just making sure it's not something that, you know, is like actively bad for your audience. Like, I don't know, the classic like marketing example is um, the Chevy Nova was a car like in the 80s that Chevy released in Mexico and Latin American countries. And Nova means doesn't go in Spanish. So like, obviously, that's an example of something that was like, that was a disaster, right? They should have tested that. But the Nova, that's like, that's an example of it's a fine name. It's, you know, right, whatever, right. like in English speaking countries is cool, but. Yeah, you know, yeah. I just said like I had brunch last. Yeah, I had brunch last week, and I went to this place called Experience, and I thought that was super cool. I'm like, I wonder how long yeah. it took him to think of that, but I mean, it works. You know, Experience, and it's just like a brunch place, so it, it works. Yeah, and and like having a fun, clever name that can work if the brand is going to be fun and clever too. I think people try to get too clever with it, right? And like, don't let that hold you back. Like, don't don't feel like you need a clever name to succeed because you don't. Right. And especially like depending on the product category too. Like if I have a brunch spot, yeah, having a clever name is probably going to help me more than if I'm selling this thing. The one thing that I will say though is just like make sure, do your homework enough to make sure that you can trademark it because that that's the biggest issue, right? If you have a name that you can't protect or a name that's actively infringing, then that's basically a non-starter and it's going to cost you, like as soon as you get successful, that is going to cost you an astronomical sum of money to deal with. So and re renaming a company is a very, very difficult thing, even if you have a lot of money to put behind it. It's really good extent to which you can avoid that. Yeah. 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 So essentially, uh, because a lot of people might be in a, well, this happened to me essentially where you think of a brand name and it, it looks good, but then you, it goes into pending mode. Right. And in order to get a uh, trademark approved, it takes like seven to nine months. Is that where you see yeah. a lot of people running into trouble where they kind of move forward with the branding, the packaging, you know, sales start coming in and then their trademarks don't get approved and they're just like, shit, what do I do now? Yeah. Well, so this is where like it pays to do the homework up front, like to pay a couple hundred dollars and actually like have have someone go through and do the trademark search, right? And make sure that it's, you know, that it's good and that you're, you have a good shot at getting it. I think the biggest thing is like, if you don't do that work, you submit and then you're like seven to nine months later, you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm hosed, right? I got to go back and do this again. And I had a client that, that did that and he's, it's taken him months and months and months and months and months because his name is essentially not trademarkable. And he's built this whole company, you know, he's doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a month in sales and he can't protect it. He can't get it on brand registry. He can't do anything. And so he's in a situation where he's like, okay, now I have to find a name that's close enough to the name that I was using that my old customers will recognize it. 
but it's also unique enough that I can get it trademarked. And that is a really hard needle to thread. Oh, I could imagine. Wow. Well, shit. Good luck to him. I mean, yeah, yep. that's the lesson number one. Make sure you uh, you pick a name that you could trademark and do some research prior instead of trying to trademark yourself. I think a lot of people try and yeah, save two, three hundred dollars versus just paying an attorney to do the trademark search. Yeah, exactly. And that I mean, just the dealing with the stuff on the back end of that, right, has already cost him like fifteen thousand dollars. So, you know, that two, three hundred bucks right there is is a wise investment. There we go. Lesson number one. Yep. All right. So so now <laughs> when, when you get the brand name, you got your brand name, you got a trademark, let's just say everything's going well and you're in stages of uh, packaging. And I was talking to a few people at the Ecom Hub Summit. Someone walked up to me. They're like, hey, man, how important do you think packaging is for e-commerce? Right. And like to me, I think packaging is a little bit more important than in retail stores, even just because that's really all people see. I mean, if you look at yeah. the way people shop on Amazon, like when's the last time someone actually read your entire title? or even read your bullets, oh, or yeah, even never. looked at I mean, all your and photos. Besides, your title is probably written more for machines than it is written for people anyways, right? No, no, that's the, that's the case. And I mean, all people really pay attention to is reviews, price, and image. Really, yep. really those top three things. So when it comes to, to the packaging scenario on Amazon, like what what's your, like, what do you usually recommend for people? Like, what do you do for, for packaging? So the, the most frustrating thing for me with Amazon sellers in general is just how unoriginal and uncreative people are, right? They go in, look at the category, find someone who's selling really well, and they essentially just do a straight rip off of their packaging, right? That to me is a huge mistake because like at best, the, like basically you just set your ceiling at like a little bit worse than that company, right? Like that, that company is like, you, you're never gonna do as good as they are. And you're probably just, you're probably not even gonna get close, but best case you could get like a little bit worse than them, right? So what I usually recommend is again, go out and have those conversations with people, try to understand what other brands they buy, not in your category, but in other categories, right? So see what foods they buy, what apparel they buy, what cars they buy, like, and just look at, like lay out all of those brands, right? And look at what those packaging looks like. Like that person is building a lifestyle for themselves based on the products and the brands that they buy from. And there's probably a common thread in the design that those brands use, right? And then you can apply that to your product category and to your packaging and use that as a jumping off point. And then all of a sudden you're gonna have something that you know works for your, the, your person, right? The person that you're building this brand around. And it also looks probably very different than the things that are in your category already. Right. And I think a, a huge trend, especially now moving forward with some of these companies is like less is more, right? So if you look at like Vital Proteins, Perfect Keto, RX Bar, yeah. a lot of these supplement brands, I think, you know, the, the less you have, the more and the louder it is. And uh, w what are your thoughts on that? Is that something you've seen kind of like a common trend in the e-commerce space as well? Yeah, it, it's definitely a common trend. So the thing that you have to be careful with any of these trends, though, is just like blindly following those trends. Um, because Vital, Vital is a great example of someone who did a great, good job with simple packaging or whatever. Uh, RX Bar, when it first came out, right, that was another great example of simple packaging that worked really well. Uh, the problem is that so many people, again, like there's so many just like copycats, right, who look, oh, RX Bar did a good job, so I'm going to design packaging that looks exactly like RX Bar. So I think quotes tend to be pretty overused just in general, but there's one that I like just keep in mind for everything that I do. And that is uh, don't follow in the footsteps of the masters, seek what they sought, right? So like, why did RX Bar's packaging work? It's not because it looked exactly like that, right? It's because it was very transparent. It listed the ingredients really clearly. They understood what their customer cared about and they designed in a way that, that spoke to that, right? And so like, yes, minimalist is good, but there is like understanding what your customer wants and being minimalist in a way that's elegant and not plain. And that's like, that's an, a tough balance too, or a fine line, right? It's like, it doesn't take much for something to feel like very under designed. So the trick is finding like, okay, how, how can I do this in a way that like looks good, that looks different from my competitors is like simple and clean and uses good design elements, but isn't like just so plain that someone's like, huh, that looks like they just did it like in, you know, Microsoft Paint. Right, right. And I think once you get into, you know, the foods and supplements and ingredients and things like that, I mean, that's a whole nother beast because the whole goal is to be transparent and kind of like less yep. is more as we mentioned. But it's also if you're dealing with the supplement, I mean, everyone's kind of used to the whole pharmaceutical industry, right, where there's just like a ton of information and yes, a lot of people exactly. don't really read a lot of it. But like if as long as there's just like small font and a lot of info, it means that it's, it's kind of pharmaceutical and it works, I guess. But the front yeah. of the packaging should be kind of plain and to the point so people like know what they're purchasing right off the bat and they don't have to think about it. Yep. 
exactly. But again, I mean, I think that there's ways that you can, like, if you understand for people who buy that supplement, like what it is they care about with that supplement or what it is that they're trying to achieve. And you use that to create, you know, some sort of simple design that shows like, hey, we have that, we understand what you want, right? That was what RX Bar did really well is that they understood that people like wanted a bar, didn't have all of this crazy shit in it, right? And so they just, you know, like, we know that that's what you care about, so we slapped it right on the front. Yeah, um, no BS. But yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so obviously let's just say, I'm on a $10,000 budget. I got my brand name down. I got my logo. Now it's starting time to, uh, you know, get some packaging down. I mean, what do you, what do you usually would recommend for someone on a smaller budget to where to go, how to create it, where to find someone? So I guess it kind of depends on the person, right? Um, my, my biggest thing that I notice is particularly with like newer entrepreneurs, right? Unless you come from a marketing background where you're used to managing creatives, um, it can be a pretty tough task to like, I, I, so many people that I've talked to are like, oh, like my packaging, like I, I hired this designer, I paid him all this money and I hate the packaging. I don't understand why it's so bad. Right. And if you go back and you look at what that person gave the creative, it's like, uh, Hey, here's my brand name. Here's my logo. I want good packaging. Here's an example of something that I like. Right. And they don't tell them anything about the customer. They don't tell them anything about like what other brands that customer buys and what they want to emulate and things like that. And then they don't understand why their packaging looks like shit. So the first step for me and, and before I even recommend like a, a place to go to find a designer or something like that is to like really have that brief nailed down and really be prepared to like just hand over like, here's what we're all about, right? Here's our mission, right? Here's who we serve. Here's what this person cares about, right? Here are the other brands that they buy from and why they like the designs, right? And if you come to the table with that information, it doesn't really matter where you go. Any designer is gonna be able to give you way, way, way better output than if you just go and say, uh, hey, hey, I like your style, make me a, a great, great package, right? Because then you're just, there's too many directions, right? Right, right. So essentially your proposal has to be, you know, like detailed enough. And really a lot of people, even on 99designs could pull it off, but you just literally exactly. have to That's give what them. I'm, like, so yeah, 99designs, a dribble actually is kind of like the next level up. It's DR, BBB, 3Bs, LE. And that's another one where it's, um, it's not contests and things like that, but you can go find designers on there and, and based on your budget and you can negotiate with them. That's actually where I would typically recommend people go. You can still find people, you know, outside the US and Europe and places like that that charge pretty reasonable prices but do great work and so even if i'm on a ten thousand dollar budget you know i can still find something that's um for like yeah five six hundred bucks or something yeah exactly and 99 designs is good right you can find good people on there uh you can also find there's a lot of shit work on there and if you don't know what you're doing in managing creative then you can like just really blow a lot of money on 99 designs getting stuff that's not very good so I think that that's a key is like really sourcing creatives up front and understanding from like ask questions from them up front too. You know, when you're in the process of looking for a creative, you should ask them like, okay, what type of information do you feel like you need to do good work? Right. And how do you like to communicate? And like asking those types of questions up front is going to get you a better outcome than if you just pick someone whose design examples you like, because every, any designer given enough time and freedom and stuff like that is going to come up with a couple things that look really nice. Right. And so their portfolio is their very best work and you have no context on how long it took them to do that or how much money the person paid them to do that or, or whatever. And so I think it's important to, to ask those questions up front, be like, what information do you need? How do you like to communicate? You know, what are reasonable expectations as far as timing goes and things like that. And if you set all those boundaries up front and you come with all of that information of who the customer is and all that kind of stuff, you're going to be able to tell, okay, this is a person that's going to be able to do what I want a lot better. Okay. Right on. You know, that, that makes perfect sense. And I know when I was, when we were even doing the Ecom hub logo, we found someone on 99 designs, but before we like, we literally kind of created like SOPs for them, like, like what they should be going through and like what we're looking for. We gave them a ton of examples and we kind of just gave them the name and they came up with this. Me and Tom still joke around because you look at Ecom hub and compare it to like the Pornhub logo. <laughs> it's not that much yeah, different, yeah, yeah. but, <laughs> but I, I don't know. Like we, that was not our, that was not our intention but it came out and it worked yeah, yeah, out yeah. so <laughs> yeah that was uh, nice. that's yeah. good and yeah so there's tons of different sources i mean yeah 99 designs upwork i mean even craigslist i mean i found really good designers locally on craigslist for a pretty affordable rate and you can meet with them sit down grab a coffee and it's a lot more you know personal and they do really solid work as you mentioned most designers can really do anything if you give them the freedom and the time exactly yeah and that's another thing too is like you know if you 
if you're willing to wait a little bit longer, you can usually get a better price. I also, I mean, it, it's a little bit of a crapshoot too, but like student designers are always looking to, you know, actually build out a portfolio. And just for them to say that they have a paid project is a big deal for them, right? That's like to have paid freelance work and to have a portfolio of that's not just like theoretical of like, here's a fake campaign I made for Coca-Cola or something like that. That can be like a, a big difference maker in them getting their first graphic design job. So if you're on a real shoestring budget and you have a local, if there's a college you know, in your city or whatever that you're nearby, that can also be a good place to go and, and try to find someone. I've had some good luck you know, earlier in my career when I was like working with tiny, tiny, tiny companies and tiny, tiny budgets. You know, I found a guy who was at University of Colorado that just like killed it and did a really good job and he was insanely cheap. So yeah, no, that's that's honestly, dude, that's a really good tip because I've been looking into this for, for quite some time, just hiring interns for my Amazon business. And I think like you mentioned, if you live in like a larger city or even if you don't, you could Google this and just find designers, people that write articles like for SEO and blogs. Like, I mean, yeah, these exactly. people they just need work samples, right? And yeah. So you're doing each other a favor, right? Right. Because you don't have the budget to pay someone expensive and they don't have any work experience. So but you can find guys that like a year later, once they graduate, would cost one hundred and fifty dollars an hour at their design firm that they're going to end up at. Right. You can get them while they're still a student and pay them twenty five bucks an hour to. Right. Build to that relationship and kind of do it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And yeah. kind of freelance it. Yeah, that's, that's really smart. And yeah, I mean, anybody listening, if you once again attended a university or something, definitely like see if there's a portal for these students because it's huge. I mean, like I go to DePaul. I mean, I'm in the city here and there's like a ton of people that like Columbia University. I mean, it's a huge arts school with people that are super artistic and stuff and they could do with photography, really anything, like anything physical. Yeah, photography is a great example of that, right? Like you can get someone with a really nice camera that they can check out from their school, right? And like way better equipment than you would be able to find. And like, they're just trying to build their portfolio. Again, they're dying for paid work. And you can get it for, you know, pennies on the dollar. Yeah, literally like a hundred bucks a day for like an entire photo shoot. Exactly, exactly. And, and DePaul's a great example of like, I'm sure that you could go online and find some design professors, right? And just shoot them all an email and be like, hey, uh, you know, I'm a local business just starting out, I'm looking to give some students an opportunity to, to do some paid work or whatever. And here's kind of what I'm looking for. Do you have anyone that you think would be a good fit? And they're gonna give you their best students. Like, yeah, they're just gonna yeah. serve them up to you and and you could get a really good opportunity. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to, to yeah. build the relationship. That's that's a really that's a really good golden nugget for anybody listening and kind of struggling on a budget and, and wants quality work at a very cheap rate and doesn't want to deal with people in second, third world countries for three bucks an hour yeah exactly and you can find great designers like in the philippines and things like that i've had i've had some luck with that but it's like a 20 percent hit rate for every one guy that i find that's actually really good i find four that are just absolute garbage and really hard to work with and, and things like that so right on awesome man so in regards to branding and positioning and whatnot kind of understanding your customer this is maybe for a little bit more of the advanced sellers right people that are already on amazon they've been there for doing it for quite some time for example like tom he launched his brand he did really good branding and stuff and you know, you're doing 50 50, 60, $100,000 a month, let's just say, right? But you really don't yep. know who your customer is. You might have, you know, your name is whatever because you just ran with it. It works. It resonates with your brand. Your packaging is really good. Great reviews. People love the product. But now it's like you're really trying to take it to the next level. Like what do what do people do in a situation where they try and maybe release new products because they just happen to, you know, do a really good job with their first two products or their first product. And now they're trying to release new products, but they're really unsure of what to release because they don't know who their customer is. And they haven't really been doing a great job of sending traffic to their Shopify store, really interviewing people. Like what's kind of like the, the next step if someone would want to work with someone like you, for example, like what would you help them with essentially? That's my question. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of my sweet spot, honestly, is that person that's, you know, maybe they're usually above 100K, usually honestly closer to 150, 200, whatever. Because at that point you have enough money to reinvest in the business that you can kind of aggressively look at other sales channels. But I mean, the first thing is you have to go out and you have to understand your customer, right? So like I'm going to say, sound like a broken record hammering on that. But the way that we do that is we actually, usually at that point, you've at least started to think about collecting email addresses. You've had, you know, at that point, you've probably served thousands of people. And over the course of that, you've had people reach out for customer service, things like that. You have an email list of a, at least a couple hundred. That can be enough to get enough people on the phone that we can actually start to have those conversations and kind of backtrack into like, okay, who is our customer? We can run ads to look alike audiences and things like that to get a sense of, okay, here are the people that Facebook thinks are like our customers and and understand kind of the differences there. But yeah, so it's it's going from being successful on a single channel that encourages you to acquire sales to looking at like, okay, what can I do to go acquire customers, right? 
people who are going to be loyal to me, people who are going to come back and buy from me multiple times, they're going to buy multiple products, they're going to talk to their friends about me, they're going to be resistant to switching to another brand, they're going to be willing to pay a price premium. It's like, it's figuring out who those people are, right, through those conversations, through surveys, through kind of continued testing and things like that to see what people are responding to. And then from there, like figuring out, okay, what systems do we need to put into place to drive traffic to our website and convert it? right? To turn Amazon from a sales acquisition channel to a customer acquisition channel to if we're looking to sell into retail, like, okay, what are we realistically going to need to do there? Right? Because that is like, that is a totally different process than selling on Amazon, it could not be more different. And so it's looking at like, okay, based on, you know, what product category you're in, what, what your customer is, and what existing assets you have in terms of are we starting from scratch? Do you literally have no customer data? Well, we're going to need to go fi like find some customer data, right? And start from there. If you have customer data, it's time to start using it, right? And to, to go out and reach out to those people and and have those conversations and then from there like turning it into the systems and stuff that you need to scale up and use those other channels effectively gotcha that's that's really cool and i know you you and tom work together on on his brand and everything and yep. he was super happy with it and trying to understand who his customer is because it's like once again selling on amazon you really have no idea who's buying that product yeah and he's a great example of you know he is not his customer right he is not a member of the people that that buy his product so he really has a hard time understanding understandably which and and you don't need to be to be successful right it's of course if you're a, a flag carrying member of your audience it's easier to understand them but even if you're not just going out and having those conversations and that was a, a big part of the process with tom i remember when i came up to vancouver and we did the workshop where we actually sat down and kind of went through everything it was just like light bulb after light bulb because it was just it was basic things that he just didn't know because Amazon didn't give it give him access to that. Right. And so that's where the fog kind of clears. And the main thing that that adds is clarity. Right. The hardest thing when you're at the stage that you're talking about, right, if you've gotten to one hundred thousand dollars, you've released a couple of products that work well, you just don't know what to do next. Right. Do you continue to launch new products? Do you try to drive people to your website? Do you start focusing on Facebook? There's a million options and each one of them if you go down that path has like a hundred different decisions that you need to make, right? And if you don't know who you're serving, then each one of those decisions is a huge pain in the ass. You're like, well, cause I just don't know, right? I don't have the information that I need to make that decision. So if you get that information, kind of bring it all together and make a bunch of decisions at the same time, then all of a sudden it becomes very easy to be like, okay, like this is what my customer would respond to here. This is what my customer would respond to here. That retail opportunity doesn't make sense because my customer doesn't shop there. Like all of a sudden things become very easy and it just becomes like, okay, now I just need to start knocking things out and, and the growth of the business becomes a lot more predictable. You just, yeah, as you mentioned, you just have a much clearer path. You know, it's, you're essentially a lot more confident in the direction you're going to go with. Exactly. And, and that's the biggest difference between someone starting a project with me and ending a project with me. Is starting a project with me, they're usually like, I just don't know. Like I've, I've, I've done the things that I've done to get to where I am, but those are not the same things that are going to continue to work to get me where I want to go. And coming out of the process, they're usually like, okay, I get it now, right? Like I have next steps. I know exactly what I need to do. And obviously like things are going to come up, path will change, all that kind of stuff. But that clarity and that sense of like, okay, I know exactly what I need to do now. Like that is, is huge, right? And that's really the key to getting from a seven figure biz business to an eight figure business. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And confidence essentially once you, before you start the product and after. So yeah, man, I mean, if people are looking forward to getting to know a little bit about you, I know you mentioned you have your own podcast, which is awesome. I have to check it out where you essentially talk about a lot of the same stuff that we just discussed, I'm assuming. Yeah, exactly. So I co-host a podcast with Ryan Moran called the Brand Builder Podcast. And it's a part of the Capitalism Network. So you can go to capitalism.com, check it out. You can find it on iTunes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, my company website is Brand Builder Strategy. I don't publish a bunch of content there or whatever, but if you want to reach out, I'm always down to answer questions, um, do things like that. And obviously, if you're interested in working together and, and things like that, you can reach out to me there as well. Uh, but my email is just max at brandbuilderstrategy.com. Brandbuilder so if you want to hit me up, I, I try to respond to any questions that I get within 48 hours. So Sweet, man. And I know a lot of other listeners listen to not only podcasts, but audibles and read a lot of books. Is there any books or, you know, audibles, whatever, Kindles, whatever that you would recommend when it comes to branding, positioning, kind of understanding customers and whatnot? Yeah. So there's a couple. Donald Miller's story brand is like the classic one that I recommend because it's really popular and it does a good job of just kind of breaking down 
thinking about your customer's journey instead of your journey I and mean, kind of the hero journey that your customer has to do. The, the way I teach brand is a little bit different than what he does, but principles are mostly the same. So I think that, that was a that's a great one to start out. A woman that I used to work for wrote a book recently called Irrational Loyalty that's really good. And then, yeah, so those are kind of the two that I'd recommend. Uh, Contagious is, I know that's one of Tom's favorite books. That's a really good one, yeah. One of my, yeah, one of my favorites as well. But yeah, so on the, on the branding front, those are the probably the three that I'd recommend. Sweet, man. Awesome, dude. Really appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time. I know you're out there uh, kind of on your vacation out in Puerto Rico, enjoying the sun. So I'll, uh, I'm going to let you go, man, and really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, David. I really appreciate it as well. Have a good one. Thanks a lot, man. Yep. Cheers.